thank you very much. So, so uh, you guys are all, it, uh, this is a class of the history of future cities, right? Mm -hmm. So we um, just pulled together a few different projects from across a few different scales um, that relate to this notion of how some of the ideas that you guys are dealing with thought that the, the class, as, as uh, Professor Bokov was putting it together, is is pretty amazing. And it's it's interesting because a lot of them are projects we're actually referencing kind of day in and day out in, in our own work. Um, so uh, this is about actually realizing the future city because um, as, as much um, fun as it is to, to read and, and, and talk and think about the potentials of it, um, it's actually something that we're given the opportunity very often to deal with, uh, sometimes even on a, on a daily basis. <coughs> um, Whenever we talk about uh, the role of urbanism uh, and architecture, this is the one image I have gone back to for a very, very long time. Um, the caption's kind of small, but it's, it's, uh, it's two hikers uh, in a very pristine landscape, um, and one of them turns to the other and says, this would be a great place to put a new city. Um, and of course, we're sort of laughing at, at the hubris of, of any two individuals uh, who, would, who would see such a beautiful landscape, and that would be their first thought. Um, but of course, that's also uh, the hubris maybe that drove uh, some people to expand a soft settlement at the tip of an island uh, into the city that we all we all know today, um, and it really was uh, this idea of planning for an unknown future, um, because when they arrived at Manhattan, as it was then known, um, and started the small cluster uh, village at the bottom, um, within a few years, by 1811, when the city is only 30,000 people, they're already planning for a, a, a city, a, a gridiron that's going to take Manhattan to two and a half million people. So if you think about the, the sort of the hubris maybe or the, or the foresight uh, it would take to literally plan the leveling of mountains, the filling of streams, the straightening of swampy shorelines uh, in order to do that, and the sort of results that we're living with today, very small, simple actions at the beginning can have incredible downstream, downstream effects. Who are the people you're talking about right now? Uh, the, original, the original settlers who arrived in Manhattan. And then, which are who? Uh, you mean the people from the Netherlands? Okay. Yeah. So that you're you're not referencing the people that were already on the island before. Correct. Correct. There were many people living on the island. They they at the time were not planning for a city of two and a half million people. Um, we see this sort of uh, idea happening again in places like Saint Petersburg. So for a very long time, Saint Petersburg was actually known as Peter's Folly. You guys probably talked about that in, in this class, and everybody was absolutely convinced that it was going to sort of go come to a very unfortunate um, end. Of course, today it's known as one of the more beautiful uh, cities in, in Europe uh, and arguably the world. And there's a lot of examples of that, of cities that have sort of uncertain stages of design and aspiration, and some of them never quite make it, and some of them do. And then I guess the question we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis is why. Um, and I think keeping a little bit of that thought in check is, is always useful when we think of the experiments that are happening today. So it's very easy to maintain a certain kind of schadenfreude about uh, an experiment like Dubai, understanding that, that the same jokes that were made about the aspirations of the people there to create a world metropolis were made at one time about St. Petersburg, about uh, Mumbai, India, about Shanghai, about New York. So I guess a couple of things to think about um, in, in the work that we do. One is that, is that ideas do become reality. And so the most utopic aspirations that seem to have absolutely no basis in, in plausibility or achievability or feasibility do actually over time uh, begin to manifest in ways that are both positive and negative. So we have the ideal cities uh, of people like Filarete and others. Uh, and certainly, while some of them were realized in, 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 uh, in certain concoctions, the ideas of sort of rational radial planning carry on all the way through uh, to the Etoile in Paris uh, and beyond. Um, we have the sort of fantasies of Harvey Wiley Corbett and the, and the multi-leveled multi city. And what's amazing is that half of his images were destined for architectural publications and the other half for humorous magazines that were making fun of architectural publications. And yet, a few years after an image like this is drawn, you have the plans of Grand Central, which really is the manifestation of the multi-level city in fact, it's such a skillful manipulation of section, I think many people forget that when you actually show up to the Great Hall, you're over 30 feet below grade. So you really are witnessing a sort of section of the city, city strata. Um, and of course, there are many examples of multi-layer cities that have been failures. There are also um, some pretty standout successes, like in Hong Kong, where you do a combination of density and a mix of uses. The sort of multi-level connected metropolis has actually been 
arguably a huge, a huge success. Um, the green city, the garden city of Ebenezer Howard, finds manifestations in, in places like Radburn, New Jersey by Olmsted. Um, gets to certain threads get picked up by Frank Lloyd Wright uh, in Broadacre City. And it's kind of hard not to see the comparison between something as prosaic as Levittown and the aspirations of a sort of fanciful city of the future that Frank Lloyd Wright came up with uh, for actually a women's magazine at the time, it wasn't even an architectural publication, um, and how prescient in some ways that was for, for better or worse. Uh, or, of course, the ultimate utopic statement, Le Corbusier's Plan de Lausanne, which achieved very, very painful manifestation uh, in, in examples like, like uh, Pruitt Igo. So, when we're thinking of the work that we're doing, there is this component of time and, and how things manifest over time. Uh, and obviously, the work of today can't necessarily always be judged for what it may do in, in 100 years, whether it's Park Avenue or, or Washington, D.C. On the other hand, I think you're going to find that there are many architects and designers that hide behind this notion that time cures all ills. So more than a few architects, I think, and I've managed to be on panel discussions with a few, will say, oh, you can't judge the work as it is right now. You have to give it 50 or 100 years to really see its fruition. Then again, a lot of cities that we think of as sort of naturally evolved actually happened very quickly. So when you think of places like Brownstone, Brooklyn, much of what you see as Brownstone, Brooklyn happened within 15 or 20 years in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. It was pretty instant in the, in the, in the scheme, of, scheme of things. Same thing with George and London. Again, the ultimate organic city, lots of little sort of small lanes. It doesn't appear to have any rational master plan until you realize that it essentially was a series of clusters that were put together by royal families. And as they went bankrupt, they effectively subdivided their own properties. So a lot of the Georgian streets in London were, again, put together in matters of 5, 10, 15 years. And nobody would go down any of these streets and say, oh, this is totally un, you know, unattractive. I can't believe that they didn't have 20 years and 10 architects working on 20 different styles of buildings to make it beautiful. Um, similar, similar logic applies to, to Paris. In this case, a superposition on an existing city. But much of the city that we know today is actually a lot, is a lot younger than a lot of New York. Because when we think of the West Village and places like that, you're talking about stuff that's from before World War II. Houseman is re redeveloping Paris in the latter half of the 19th century. Um, and the city we know today ma manages to maintain a certain kind of architectural unity um, because of that. I think the last thing to, to keep in mind is this idea that cities are fundamentally for people. So as planners, we spend a lot of time looking, obviously, at the Noli plan and other images like that. But at the end of the day, the success of a plan like that is really that it's describing places like the Piazza del Popolo, that it's really describing a way that, that people are occupying a city. And that even if there are systems of circulation and connections and all nodes and networks and all, and all the sort of ideas that permeate urban planning for hundreds of years, it's the manifestation as urban space that we can actually occupy that's the most important. Similarly in New York, this idea of the multi-layered infrastructural city finds its ultimate apotheosis in a place like Rockefeller Center where you see that section exposed, the below great city, the above great city. And even somebody like Le Corbusier uh, knew that, which is why some of his most powerful images of his urbanism weren't the aerial photographs. But that necessity, and I love this image, to draw the coffee table, the guy having breakfast, you know, just recently having stood up from having breakfast or a cup of coffee in terms of viewing this whole vista. So even, even the sort of person who seemed to be least concerned in terms of the urban planning with the individual expression of space was in fact thinking about it in terms of how we as people interact and, and deal with it. So as we think of why we, we build or expand cities, um, I think one of, the, one of the questions we always come back to is, why would a city be here or be expanded or be built? Who is it for? And what are the techniques that we, we have uh, to begin to create the sort of successful aspects of, in a way, instant cities, cities that you sort of design and hope may happen a lot more quickly than they would have otherwise and naturally. Um, I'm going to go through uh, about half a dozen examples today. Um, one of the great things of, a, of an organization like ours is I've worked on some of these, many of these, but not all of them. Um, but it is sort of testament, I think, to the sort of collaborative nature um, of, the, of the practice that we're constantly aware of each other's works. You know, we're, we're moving in and out of each other's teams and constantly getting ideas back and forth um, as we're doing our work at different scales. So I'm going to be moving from kind of very large scale, which is literally an entire city the size of Boston. That's about two-thirds complete um, in Korea down to the size of a computer chip. 
um, and some of the digital techniques that we're using as we're beginning to, to further analyze and understand cities, cities today. Um, <clears throat> and I guess, especially because we're a smaller group, if there's any questions as we go along, I'm really glad that you asked the questions that you did. By all means, like, it's much better to, to chat and discuss than actually just sort of like go, go through projects. And I really think that no matter like the room or the situation, so. Okay. <laughs> um, so I guess the the uh, with um, so the first one this this uh, this sort of new city in, in Korea, um, the question is really can quality of life be considered a national project, and um, we know the idea of the national project because we have cities uh, such as Brasilia um, or Chandigarh or today Mazdar uh, in Abu Dhabi that are really conceived of by nations or nation states as an expression of something, be it a political change, be it a transformation of a national economy for whether it really happened or not from oil-based to, to sustainable technology-based or whatever. So I guess the question that, that we were asking as we started to get involved in the city is, can a national project be actually about the quality of life of the city, the sort of nature of urban experience, which is why we all choose to live in cities rather than lots of other alternatives that, of where we could live. And more importantly, can you achieve something like that in a mud flat that's 2,200 acres um, in, a, in a bay that is being terraformed as you are literally even beginning to think about the project? And even more importantly, why would you go to such a great length to create a city there? So Sando City was a city in Korea that has a very long uh, time horizon before it ever got started. Mm. In the 1990s, it starts out as an idea for a new technology center actually developed by LG. Uh, and the idea is very much at the time that it's going to be something like Shenzhen or others are today, really a factory town, a place where technology is going to be made and the workers that are in support of it will live. Um, that, uh, for a lot of reasons, goes belly up in the mid-90s, one of the biggest ones of which is the Asian financial crisis. So you have uh, a country that was very confident of its future, that suddenly finds itself at, at the mercy of very unforgiving international conditions. And so one of the decisions made actually was to double down on building the city, but to change its purpose entirely. Um, and really as making it a gateway to the country, and then also a gateway from the country to the, um, to the entire region. And what you find is that within a matter of hours flight, during like maybe four to six hours, you can get something like two-thirds of the world's population. You can get some of the most active and dynamic economic centers. And so the, the question is whether a country like Korea, which in some ways at the time had been a little bit peripheral to places like Japan and China and others, could actually establish itself as a new regional, a new regional center. At the same time, you obviously have the beginning of the, the absolute mass industrialization of China. And so there's very small chance that a country like Korea can really compete as China is getting more and more advanced technologically, right? M moving from socks to iPhones. So the simultaneous debate that's happening at the same time is, is there another model? Because the model that's being done by countries like Korea at this time is one that had been followed by, by many countries, including China since, is sort of growth through industrialization. But the question is, to a certain extent, is, there, is that model a dead end? Because there's always somebody who can do it cheaper than you, and what are you sort of left with? So the focus instead becomes about trying to uh, create models of urbanism that will lead to a certain idea of quality of life. And if you create a place that people want to live rather than a place that they have to, might it actually attract international companies? Might it actually allow you to retain some of your best and brightest people? Um, and might it serve as a model for the, the kinds of urbanism that's happening by default anyway in a rapidly growing, growing country? So this was an aerial image that uh, was, I think, was a, the result of, of about four years of work um, in early 2000. Um, and the city where, as it was built maybe three years ago. Um, and so you can sort of see the, the main uh, central, central park, um, the beginning of a number of the buildings that are around it. And that sort of curious, uh, you know, like Park Avenue photograph, that curious sort of half finished state where you have one part of it that's incredibly dense and one part of it that's still sort of fallow fields. I kind, of, I kind of like showing this image because, let's say, a couple of years from now, that sort of state of coming into being is not going to be, it's not going to be visible anymore. Now, a couple of things you guys will, will, will notice about this city right away um, as we look at the master plan. 
One is the way that it's conceived, is it's conceived of a series of actually smaller clusters. So rather than trying to superimpose one really sort of massive overarching organizational strategy, the idea is to begin to break it down into a series of pieces that are more or less complete as they, as they begin to grow. So you're not waiting for the whole thing to, to happen, to realize all of the promise of a city built around people that might happen day one. And you can understand why that would be, right? Like if you can imagine building Central Park with nobody around it, like those early photographs have, there's not really an audience to use it. So what you kind of need is to begin to do things sequentially. And it's a sort of kitchen and uh, chicken and egg scenario. You're not gonna show up to live anywhere there isn't a good school, and there's no point in putting in a good school if there's nobody living there. So, and if, even if you could build a great park, nobody would enjoy it if there's nobody there. So it's the sort of, how do you begin to move all the pieces forward at the same time when there is, rightfully so, a healthy degree of skepticism that anything like this can actually happen? So one of the major strategies um, was to conceive of a, a neighborhoods as a series of clusters. To get a sense of the scale of this, we're talking about a city about the size of, of Boston. So 2,200 acres, ultimate population of about 40,000 to 50,000 people uh, just in, in, this, in this area. Um, so in the middle, we have something that we called um, the Central Park, and then coming off of it, a series of clustered neighborhoods, and we'll talk about how each one of those are arranged. Um, then a, an avenue uh, that sort of bisects the whole thing, and then other clusters that you see sort of pinwheeling, pinwheeling out of that. Um, now the decision to put a park in the middle of this, you can imagine, was an incredibly contentious one. Of course, you know, the, 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 the mayor, the government, the developers come in, the first day we say, okay, you should take the middle of your city and leave it absolutely empty. There should be absolutely nothing there but a big park. So right away, you can imagine, that this is ludicrous, this is crazy, why would you do that? And then you start to go through it. You have New York and Central Park, you have Boston and Boston Common, you have Hyde Park and Kensington Gardens in London, and you can just keep going on, English Garden in Munich, Tier Garden in Berlin, and as you go around the great cities in the world, you discover that really at their heart is a void, very often. And that void is a place for, for, for people to do all of the myriad activities of urban living that can't be neatly tied into housing, and office, and shopping, or whatever. So there's museums, there's art galleries, there's playgrounds, there's running tracks, there's gardens. So the idea that actually at the very, very heart of the city, you would, you would put this park and allow it to sort of be a free space that way you could design, but not really know how it's going to be programmed, was a really important part uh, of the strategy of how the city came into being. What was really important also is this was actually the first thing in the city to be built. Um, to the point where people would come, this is about maybe an hour outside of some, uh, Seoul, people would take the train out of Seoul to go use this park because it was proximate, connected by transit, and, and available to them. Um, at the heart of the park are a series of meandering courses whether it's walks or running tracks. There's also um, a canal that connects all of, the, all of the different parts of the park together. And so the park then begins to take on multiple roles. It's not just uh, a green lung for the city. It's also a way of connecting the city through water, through, through boats, through leisure. You can, you can stroll through the park as opposed to just efficiently getting from point to point. It also had an important sustainable uh, function, which is that it's actually catching treating and absorbing rainwater from the very, very beginning. So the park is serving as an actual um, sustainable engine, or environmental engine for the entire city from day one. And literally, the way the park is engineered, it is actually a sponge that's responsible for holding the gray water for almost the entire district. So coming out of that park, we began to develop a series of districts. Um, roughly speaking, what you call the residential neighborhoods are in yellow. The commercial neighborhoods are blue, and let's say the 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 um, shopping neighborhoods are in, in orange, and then the sort of paler orange are special pieces. This is a very convenient zoning diagram, but actually sort of completely irrelevant to the truth, because no neighborhood is completely all residential any more than no neighborhood is completely commercial. But in a way of beginning to understand how these, these different districts come together, I think it's a helpful diagram. Um, and for us, it was this idea that within complete proximity of you, you should have access within, by walking, by bike, by bus, by car, by subway, at various different scales, to all of the different functions of a 24-hour city. So I think this is a far more illustrative diagram. It's not just because it's actually a plan, 
but because you can read within it the sort of varieties of grain and scale that actually constitute the modern city. The way this was done, and I want you to kind of keep in mind uh, this for some work that we're doing now, um, is very much by creating a series of maps of what are reasonable distances for people to walk and what are the activities that you are willing to walk to. What are reasonable distances for people to bike or take a bus or take a car. And so there's, there's certain kind of things that you want and need very close. And then there are other areas that you're willing to sort of go farther and farther and farther for, ultimately before, before leaving the city. So as we ran the different ideas of how we might plan the city across, we were actually constantly trying to plot for people living or working in different parts of the city, are they actually getting the sort of mix of all the uses that they need within, within close proximity? Um, and again, because this was done you know, at this point almost 15, 20 years ago, um, 15 years ago, we were just starting to actually, we would do this manually. We would run these simulations, plot out points, what are the different ways that people would work. And so the various different strategies we're comparing in terms of block size, in terms of variety of uses, were sort of always mapped against these scenarios of whether it was a family going about the, the daily activities of a family, dropping off a kid at daycare, going to school, picking them up, going to the doctor, going to the playground, versus friends, which is really about socializing, restaurants, places to do shared activities, museums, galleries, etc., versus people visiting, uh, whether it's for business or for pleasure. And it, this is just one of a countless number of scenarios you can imagine the one they begin to plot out for a city. So the question really was, can you design a city around the way that people might use it, rather than a priori system thinking of, is it grid, is it circle, is it network? Three-dimensionally, we also began with a complete utter rejection of the typical sort of uh, suburban typology that you see around most cities in the world. Um, in America, we see this here inside the city. But if you go to much of Europe or Asia, outside the historic city centers, you see miles of these sorts of unbroken slabs, right? They're efficient, they're easy to house people. I'm sure you've seen them outside of Paris, you've seen them outside of Mexico City, you've seen them outside of Moscow, you've seen them outside of, of Hong Kong, Seoul. So one of the things we were very invested in is this idea of heterogeneous scale. That not only can you mix uses, but you can also mix densities and heights. So the block structure was set up in such a way that each of the blocks is housing all of the different scales, or a mix of scales, uh, for various different building types. That you're reinforcing street walls, yes, but you also have the relief of breaks in the courtyard typology, changes in height. And then at the heart of each one of these sort of, call it the residential neighborhoods, which as you start to get into it, you can see also have retail and small office and hotels in them, you have a school. And the school was another thing that was built day one. Because if you think about even in a place like the US, What's the number one driver for why people move? A lot of times is, where do you have a, a, a school, a good school? But schools are more than just places to educate children. Right? How many of you guys go play basketball at, you know, in, in the playgrounds of the schools? You're able to, you know, a lot of them double as small parks. There's, there's communities, there's places to visit. And so you can see here in the sort of uh, the way that the city grew, this idea of the mix of scales, the indoor-outdoor, what's inside the block versus on the street, um, and the sort of variety of materials that we hope maintain the same level of visual interest um, that you see here as you would, for example, in a street that happened fairly instantly in Brooklyn in the 1880s. This idea of richness, depth, variety, material, and texture. Um, and this is one of my favorite shots of the, of the city because this is one of those linear canal elements that we talked about at the very beginning. And these were built, again, one kilometer long at one time, many of them in advance of the neighborhoods behind them. So they needed, in a, in a, in a sense, almost like a sort of Potemkin village, to have all of that vitality in life for a, populate, a much larger population that would only grow over time. Um, and again, we were um, one of the ways you sort of kind of know you're successful is if you guys remember the music video Gundam Style, about two thirds of it was was uh, was filmed in, in in Sango City. So that was our like like five minute claim to claim to fame. What was that? Uh, Gundam, Gundam Style. So is this all? Everything in this image is KPF architecture. Everything in this image is KPF architecture, but very little in the whole city was. Okay. And I'm curious about the mural the, on the bricks. It says "Be Gentle" or something. Like that. Uh, yeah. What is that? Is that built into your design, or how does that um, get placed there, and who's the artist, or what is the role of the... 
Um, I, I wish it was art. I think more likely it was uh, a label from one of the stores that was around around the way. Um, what's really interesting about uh, about Seoul in particular, but about much of Korea, is the idea is to say it operates at, at multiple scales. So there's a lot of this um, sense of discovered space that emerges out of the, uh, the remnants of the old city. And I use the word remnants very carefully because Seoul is one of the sort of there's a number of cities, but let's say one of the more recent cities that was almost completely destroyed in a war, right, in the Korean War. So much of that city fabric, very little of it remains, and very little of it was rebuilt in, in sort of place. So the idea of conceiving of this particular um, urban experience as a kind of series of smaller found spaces was something that was very immediately uh, appropriated uh, by a number of, of people living in, in Seoul who were very happy to sort of move to something that even if it was purpose-built, maintained some of that same character. And then also by a, a particular class of retailer. So, which is also, again, really, if you think about it, always a challenge. Because when you, when you think about cities like New York or, or Paris or any number of other ones, like, you know, um, or, uh, you know, uh, even, even, even like, um, Condesa are some of the best public places in Mexico City as an example. I keep mentioning it because I was, I was there not too long ago. Um, there's a sort of, the types of retailers that you see are not big national chains, right? But those are not the ones, that those emerge because you have lots of people and people willing to take a risk and start their own coffee shop or whatever. When you build something new, it's very hard to get those types of things to happen naturally, correct? So normally what you end up with is the kinds of people that can sort of put a store in the hopes that if they build, somebody will come which unfortunately is national retailers, no matter where you go. So the idea that we created a space that people found so convincing that, there, that small restaurants and shops from within Seoul were willing to open their, sometimes their second location in, was in a, in a very, it was kind of, in a very weird way, a compliment to the potential of what, of what the space could be. Okay. I'm just curious, like, if you guys, if your hands are still on it at the scale of the programming of murals and public art, or if uh, at some point, that's handed to a developer, and they sort of need to fill this amount of storefronts and, and including the murals that are. Available. Right. I think that's a really good question. So, um, number one, the art program actually here we were a part of, um, and art was a part of the the sequence of spaces that made up um, this this project. Um, also, the idea of the fact that you didn't just have a continuous expanse of glass. So, if you if you think about again a lot of recent New York architecture, this idea that the first two floors have to be unbroken glass because it's whatever the retailer wants. Definitely not here. Um, the variety of material textures, so the fact that you got one kind of brick over there and a different kind of brick over there with then the sort of like screen pattern, that was entirely us. But the idea very much that, that the unexpected is going to happen, whether it's signs that have to go on to it, whether it's posters that are put up, the sort of, I'm, I'm literally using that word precisely, the reappropriation of these services by the various people using it is is was not was planned for, but not our doing. Yeah, great questions. So, sort of jumping and moving down a scale, um, we were approached actually by many of the same individuals that had been involved in the city of Korea, were from Boston. So an opportunity came up to actually do um, sort of Boston's first new neighborhood since since Back Bay, um, and ironically enough, and this also sort of speaks to the sort of global flows of of how knowledge and people shift. Korea, after the financial crisis, reaches out to an international consortium in conjunction with local Korean companies, so architects globally, landscape architects globally, developers, banks, engineers, and so on, all partnered up with local partners. How many people in Boston have ever built a new neighborhood or new city? Not except the people that had been involved in a project to do a new city in Korea. So that knowledge, that capability came back and this sort of unique opportunity opened up um, and the city actually took a complete advantage. So one of the things that we talk a lot about is this idea of innovation. And innovation is something that gets talked about so much right now that I think most people have this sort of idea that it looks something like Soho or um, Dumbo or Tribeca or some kind of warehousey warehouse sort of district. And, and Boston, as an old port city like New York, of course, has plethora of these sort of cast iron, big brick loft warehouses and so on. But what's really odd, of course, is that some of the world's most innovative companies have been created in, in buildings like this. This is uh, where Steve Jobs and Wozniak actually started uh, Apple, the, the first go around. Um, 
And so there is a little bit of this question that, that to a certain extent there's a challenge as an architect or an urbanist is that innovation can obviously happen in places that we've never considered to be innovative, like the suburban side streets of Palo Alto. Um, so when somebody comes to you and says, okay, well, we really need to recapture our innovation, we're losing it to, to San Francisco. They have far more um, patents than we do. You know, Boston, we used to be this great technological place. We used to have all these companies. They've all moved to San Francisco. Like, we, we need to be innovative. How do you do it? You sort of have to be honest and say, well, it, you know, there's a certain amount that maybe is invested in form and a certain amount that isn't because even places like suburban Palo Alto can become uh, very innovative until you sort of start to dig into it about what it was that made suburban Al Palo Alto innovative. So it had Stanford University. It had a couple of military bases. For a very long time, people forget about this now, the engineering concerns for a lot of the largest car manufacturers weren't in Detroit, they were here. So Ford and GM, Toyota, when they opened up their first plant. So remarkably, actually, um, Silicon Valley on paper is not very dense, but in reality, actually, or it was in, when you walk through it, when you drive through it, it's not very dense, but in, in reality, it's actually quite dense. And it's quite dense with an ecosystem of, of organizations, universities, companies, um, government agencies that are all involved in sort of technology and research. The sort of impromptu meetings and occurrences that happened that eventually led to companies like Apple and Google and others were sort of latent in that dense mix. So the question really became, is there a way to kind of foster that sort of dense mix um, next to an existing city? So the area we're talking about is the area um, all in white over here, and it's immediately adjacent to, to downtown Boston. When I say immediately adjacent, a walk from here to there is about 10 minutes. So for many years, this was the rail yards that serviced um, the, the port of Boston before, like many ports, it sort of moved to, to deeper waters. Uh, when those were decommissioned, you were just left with tons and tons of parking lots. How, how many people here have been to the ICA in Boston? So you know like the sort of cantilever museum, Dylan's video? Anyway, it's really worth going to. It's an, it's an amazing museum. You guys will remember you have to traverse all of these parking lots. So all of those used to be massive, massive train yards. Um, the hope is, over time, that we're going to turn it into a sort of little slice of the city, um, like this aerial watercolor, <coughs> which I always think is a very kind of useless way to, to show cities, but sort of, I guess, necessary when you're, when you're trying to get uh, community approvals. But it is uh, an attempt at evoking a certain kind of, of scale and approach. I think the, the better story is to start getting into why this particular piece of land with its proximity to central Boston would seem to be a place that innovation could happen, and what it was that we as designers could do to sort of bring that out. Um, the first thing to note is that it is not only extraordinarily proximate to downtown Boston, but also to the South Station and the airport. So you can get, and, and Boston's one of the only cities I know of in the world where the, the, the airport's actually right in the center of town. So you can get from the site to the airport in less than 10 minutes. And often when I go up to Boston, it takes me longer to get to LaGuardia than it does get from LaGuardia to Boston to the office that I'm going to, which is a pretty scary thought in terms of New York transportation. Um, the second thing is that both the airport and the train station, they make this a critical node in terms of the Northeast megalopolis. So arguably one of the largest urban conurbations in the world is all connected by train, rail, and, and short plane flights to that specific point. Um, so when you think of these proximities though, you really have to begin to create a reason for people to come and a kind of urban density that would encourage people to find each other, find like interests. And the idea that we, that we sort of had is if you create a place that people want to be, want to live, want to work, but also want to play, want to do things that you can't even predict, the likelihood given that you already have a place, I mean, Boston already has a lot of great things going for it. It has amazing institutions, it has amazing companies. It just wasn't holding on to them. If you create a sort of destination where people want to be, then perhaps the rest of it will follow suit. So it's kind of a, a big experiment, a kind of, if you build it, will they come kind of, kind of question. Um, urbanistically, 
you can think of Boston as a superimposition of several different networks or several different layers. So the first, obviously, is the fine-grained texture of the original city and the various neighborhoods that have emerged over time. The second is a series of sort of more singular mega blocks or pieces, whether it's City Hall, the train stations, or the universities, because each university might be made up of many small buildings. But if you guys think of, like, for example, a next door neighbor like NYU, the ability of a university to act as a sort of transformative piece to a piece of fabric around it is pretty amazing. There's few organizations that are more able, like they're like a you know a tree growing within a piece of rock, able to sort of very slowly over time completely transform the, the physical fabric of, of areas around them. And then Boston, unlike New York, say New York is really concentrated on say in Central Park, there's a, an entire network of green spaces, the the, the emerald necklace uh, of, of Olmsted that stitches all of the different neighborhoods together. So one of the first things that we that we really did was sort of study the hierarchy of neighborhood, how people walk, how people drive, um, buses, transportation, and also the hierarchy of corresponding green spaces that go along with it. Because each of these greens are sort of working together. And if you think about New York City, Central Park works because there's a certain scale of urbanism that happens around it. But if you go to a lot of the larger parks in the outer boroughs, they don't work as well because you have these very fine grained small streets that dead end in these very big open parks. And the sort of schism that happens between the two different scales of urbanism, we find we believe makes it a little bit less less successful. Um, so if on the left was the sort of program and grain of the of the city before, this neighborhood before, the seaport district, on the right is what the district became uh, or was going to become uh, over time. So in terms of infill, there was a couple of different strategies that we then did. One obvious one is that you extend the prevailing grid of the historic city to those parts that are immediately adjacent to it. There's also an emergent larger scale of buildings that happens off of the waterfront. And you can think about that here in New York City as well, right? If you, if you go down to the waterfront next to the meatpacking district, some of the largest buildings in the entire city are those that are in the blocks just, just inside from the water. Then there's the sort of infrastructural brain that happens. So another thing that, that freed the site up to be reinvented as a new neighborhood was the Big Dig. And the Big Dig connected to a tunnel that went to the airport, and that tunnel and the associated buildings that came out of it and the port buildings are, are, are right here at the, at the edge of the site. And so when you bring all of those textures together and sort of crisscross them across each other, you have the ability to create a neighborhood that's sort of stitching the various different conditions around it together. Um, and in a sense, comes up with a grain that's neither one nor the other, but perhaps has the potential of being a little bit more interesting. Um, this was a, a different aerial uh, image, um, particularly looking at the sort of block in the foreground, but also begins to talk about the way that these different scales and grains extend the various different immediate neighborhoods around the city, then also back to the existing downtown um, in, in the uh, upper part of the image. So, why are these networks so important? I mean, architects always love to do this. We like to analyze sort of scales of grids and why does that make it good in terms of how, how a city or a neighborhood <coughs> might grow? So a major part of it is really fostering sort of connectivity. So you're not just becoming a sort of sink or a place unto yourself, but something that's actually stitching all of the best of the various different neighborhoods around you. Neighborhoods that used to be separated but are now being brought together. Um, one of the ways that we strengthen that is also by extending the sort of green networks, again, the emerald necklace along the waterfront, and then through various different streets and boulevards to a specific series of, of green spaces, each one of which is anchored by an activity. So the main square that you see sort of um, in the upper part of the picture, right, right there, um, was anchored by something we call the district hall. So this was a building that was built actually by the development community that were, that were putting these buildings up that was going to have a series of shared conference spaces, um, technology support spaces, coffee shop. But if you think about small companies, all the infrastructure that's very expensive for them to develop for themselves, there was a feeling that if that could be provided and anchoring a park that people actually went to, you'd begin to have the sort of seeds of an ecosystem for work. So the major thrust then of the, of the master plan became stitching these different textural elements together so that you begin to link a park and a node with one kind of activity with a street and a node and another kind of activity in a sequence that stretched 
all the way from the existing city through the sort of new, new extension. And one of the things that, that great cities have is this emphasis on urban experience. So if you think about a city that emerged in time cycles like New York, if you kind of go up Broadway, which is a, a street you guys all know very well, you transition from neighborhood to neighborhood, you know the precise moments when those transitions happen. When Soho suddenly opens up and you get to the area just south of Union Square. When you transition again and you're suddenly in Madison Square Park. When you transition again past the Flatiron Building. So each of these sequences is sort of marked by a threshold. And that threshold has two functions in a way, or, or ser serves two functions. It sort of lets you know that there's a change. And it also frames and connects you to that next urban experience. So you know that the different neighborhoods are, you know the characters of the different places. But then it also seems not that they are being separated, say like by a highway, but that it's a very, a very thin and easy membrane to cross. So the way that we conceive of the urban experience then of moving through the neighborhoods that we were, or the parts of the neighborhood that we were developing in Boston was much the same way. Now, here is a case where, where reality is not always as kind um, as the aspirations that one has for the design. So after completing the master plan, neither ourselves nor the developers that were originally involved in the master plan uh, went on to do the first series of buildings. Um, the financial crisis hit and the sites began to be flipped to other developers at a time when there was a lot of uncertainty, again, as to whether a new neighborhood in Boston um, could, could happen. So there were a lot of very conservative decisions taken in terms of the architecture, and then a lot of the investments in the streetscape. This is, this is no, no boulevard. This is just a wide street. Um, were not taken at the beginning. And it's unfortunate, but in a, in a way it's a little bit of a teaching moment because nobody likes Paris for the street grid. So this idea that you can simply plan a city and not actually have any investment in the vertical surface, in the art, in the texture of sidewalks, or all the other aspects of urban experience, that you can just sort of like plan the systems, but not necessarily the spatial uh, and urban experience, that if you don't choreograph that, will you have a great neighborhood? The answer is no. So what was really um, very in, uh, heartening is that when this was starting to happen, there actually was a, a beginning of a real outcry against that. The media, the community came up against it. And so um, we as architects and other really good architects were started to get invited back in to do, to do buildings. So the project that I'm currently working on, which is this very large block that you see in the foreground, is attempting to rectify some of the lack of urban spatial refinement, urban spatial control from the first series of buildings, and this idea of opportunities for secondary found spaces, smaller intimate public spaces. So one of the first things we did is we actually convinced the developers to actually hollow out the block and create a very large piazza in the middle of the block. And again, the idea here is that by creating these opportunity for pedestrian rich spaces, you're not only allowing different sides of the neighborhood to be connected through this block, but you're actually, in a way, enhancing value, of course, right? That, that by giving back to the public, that by creating spaces that are really meaningful and desirable to go to, you're going to create a destination where people are going to want to go, which is ultimately going to have you know, success both in terms of the community and also in terms of, of the development. I guess the good news over time is, despite the early and growing pains of the master plan, it has succeeded in terms of attracting innovation, um, not only have there been lots of established companies, there have been hundreds of startups that have chosen to locate here. And most recently, um, Amazon just uh, announced that they're opening their, not the headquarters, uh, but their largest current nor um, offices in the Northeast are in Boston. So they're going to move 4,000 employees there. Um, in addition, you have the headquarters for GE um, and a lot of other, other companies. So this notion that if you focus on urban experience, quality of life, a variety of different spaces and a mix of uses, you will create the kind of ecosystem where people will want to be, at least now is starting to bear some, some fruit. Uh, the next experience that um, is interesting to talk about is whether a future city can infill into an existing city without replacing it. And what I mean by that is, it's an experience that we've seen all around us. So if everybody thinks of sort of Soho in the 1970s, when this amazing group of artists and curators, choreographers and writers, 
some of the most interesting and innovative work in terms of design was happening. And the Soho of today is very, very different. So in some senses, it's been a victim of its own success. It's been arguably turned to a little bit of a sort of minimal version of itself that we all sort of like visually, but we would have to argue that a lot of the things that we loved about Soho at the beginning have sort of um, disappeared. Um, and that's actually had deleterious effects to Soho itself, because there are some shopping streets in Soho that are completely packed, but there are others that are kind of empty, because if you're not there to shop for very expensive furniture, there's less and less reason to go at all, right? So one of the questions that cities that are existing deal with all the time is how do you allow transformation to happen in a way that doesn't sort of kill the goose that laid the golden egg? Can neighborhoods transform over time in a way that doesn't necessarily lose all those qualities of the neighborhood that you liked in the first place? So this is Covent Garden, which is the middle of London. How many people have been there? One. You guys could get out more. <laughs> sitting here listening to boring lectures. You should be getting in a plane right now and going to London. Um, two weeks. Two weeks, yeah. So the uh, Covent Garden for, for many years was literally a convent garden. That's the, the, the origin of the name. It eventually became a wholesale district. Uh, and so this, this very large hall that you see in the foreground was built um, to house uh, sellers of food, fruit, flowers, and so on. Um, it eventually became quite uh, a sort of desirable place um, to live and to work, and quite famous at the same time also uh, for a lot of the street activities. So, you know, um, street performers, um, artists of all sorts, um, actual artists, not just the ones that are doing this real, like, kind of spray paint things, um, which is sad truth of too many, too many of these places like that today. Um, acrobats, you know, I mean, it's, it, when I was living in London even, even 15 years ago, it was just, you never knew what you were going to uh, be seeing over there. The interesting thing about it is, and we, we mentioned this at the beginning, London seems like it grows organically, but because of the land holdings of the original series of families or estates that owned it, a lot of neighborhoods in London can actually have a single owner. Because in, in the UK, a lot of these larger estates were sold through ground leases. So they weren't necessarily carved up like in New York where you know you get a little piece and you get a little piece. They would, uh, the houses, the, the different royal families, as they needed to raise money, would empower certain companies or organizations to act on their behalf and then begin to subdivide the land and rent it out essentially to people. Which means that periodically you have these sort of once in a lifetime opportunities to rethink and reinvent a neighborhood holistically. And of course, here's the crisis. Everybody loves the neighborhood. You don't want to reinvent it. You don't want it to change. But change it is, right? Because the more successful it becomes, a certain kind of retailer moves in, maybe not a retailer that's compatible with acrobats and artists and impromptu choreographers. The more touristy it becomes or the more expensive it becomes, the harder it is for people to live there. And so ultimately, you can't freeze a neighborhood in ember. But you can also try to, um, I guess the question is, can you try to exacerbate those qualities of a neighborhood that make it most interesting? So we were approached here to do a master plan, not on a, on, a, on a blank site, but a master plan for a new city that was effectively, or a new neighborhood that was effectively going to exist within an existing, already functioning neighborhood. And already you could begin to see happening some of the things that were happening in places like Soho, which is as it got more and more successful, you could say maybe the retailers were higher end and maybe they were paying more rent, but it was also less lively. And so you could sort of, the question is, how do you sort of manage that, that, that sense of urbanity and that sense of, of uh, vitality and variety? So one of the, the, uh, the first things we started to do was look very closely at the neighborhood, not as a texture of streets, but really as a sequence of urban experiences. Um, as moments of nodes, whether it's Seven Dials or the actual um, flower hall itself, and then try to see if there are ways to insert at very critical nodes small catalytic pieces of new architecture or, or urban decisions that would take what was otherwise, for example, a dead-end street and give it something at the end of it that would be a draw. Something that has a sort of intricacy of, of detail and craft that would be able to enliven an entire, an entire street. Um, the, the team began to develop a series of strategies that had to deal with historical grain, public space, and circulatory routes. 
And if you think about cities, it's not only about the space of the street, it's also about the spaces of the courtyards um, and links that, that connect them all together. So, you know, first thing, one of the first things that the team did was in a way remap the city, not as the kind of image that you look at, like a plan, but actually as a sort of drawing of the urban experiences that one can have, walking, going through courtyards, finding unexpected alleys, finding certain buildings that you can actually get inside. So think of this as a sort of three-dimensional Noli plan, uh, a, a drawing of the narrative of urban experiences. And as we zoomed in, you can begin to say, okay, there's a building like the one above that you can already get into. There's a street like the one below that's very lively. Is there a way to begin to connect the two? Are there surgeries that we can do within the neighborhood fabric that begin to tie these pieces together? Um, there was a series of steps of excavation, preservation, um, stitching together that were undertaken. And so within the dead centers of a lot of these blocks, there was found space. The sort of gaps between buildings that were never really public to begin with. Could those be reappropriated, turned into new urban realms, and then brought back to the public? So you begin to have a multiplicity of different urban experiences, and you are actually creating new public space, even while you haven't changed the overall figure ground of the neighborhood virtually at all. Uh, and this is an example of, of a couple of those. Um, I think there was a couple of other projects I wanted to, to, to talk about, but maybe actually what I might do is jump forward to just two last ones. Does that sound okay? Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about Hudson Yards, you guys already know it. It's big and very fun. Um, you guys, are, you, are you working on that? Yeah. Of course. Wow. I, I would like to know a little bit more <laughs> with you guys. Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to take like, a two minute break then maybe, and then keep going, or how do you guys want to do it? I mean, you're cold, you're cold. You're cold. You're cold. You're cold. You're either, you're either you're like, like dead asleep or, or, or awake. Do well, you guys have any questions so far? And then... No? Okay, awesome. Um, <laughs> Do you have a question? Not yet. Not yet. Uh oh. Um, so, I think as we go down and scale now, it's not necessarily well. Not necessarily always about re-envisioning an entire an entire city, um, but there are acts of architecture that operate in that sort of in-between mm -hmm. master planning, and they have the potential of of transforming um, a city. So uh, one of my favorite examples um, has nothing to do with New York. It's actually Palazzo Farnese in in Rome. Within 25 years of that palazzo being built, the gravity of the city shifts from around Piazza Navona to the south to what had been the former flower market. So in a very similar way, mm, acts of, of architecture like Grand Central can create new, new centers or new hubs. So when we think of a place like New York, I think instinctively we understand that it actually has multiple centers, right? There's sort of one cluster around Grand Central, there's another cluster sort of down the financial district. We kind of get that there's like sort of like one around Madison Square, and even within a place like Midtown, which people call like one big sort of downtown district, we all sort of know there's a big difference between like Sixth Avenue, Park Avenue, the stuff up by Central Park, through these sort of hubs. And one thing we also kind of knew is that for a very long time there wasn't much west of Sixth Avenue. Times Square took a very long time to sort of redevelop and so on. So the real question when you're dealing with a place like Hudson Yards is it's not just about one new development or one new piece of a city, but can you actually begin to reorient the, the, the gravity of an entire city, begin shifting it westward? And it's, it sort of seems weird now, but to remember, there was a, a very long time where people thought that the center of gravity of New York City could never move west. And of course, things like the High Line happened, the Meatpacking District came into its own, and now obviously there's no, I don't think we would generally consider the west side to be you know, inferior in any way to the east side. But for a very long time, it was considered it would be impossible to, to, to get anybody to want to live west of 7th Avenue or you know, I mean, north, north of, the, of, of the village. Or no company would ever rent an office building that would be you know, west of, of 8th Avenue. Um, and this is even as, as recently as 10 years ago. It's not, not like we're talking about like the 50s and 60s. So 
the idea of an emerging district that happens sort of west of Penn Station, uh -huh. this is a few years ago, to what might happen in the future. This is also an idea that was afloat at one point for relocating Madison Square Garden, maybe so we could make a great, a great Penn Station. Um, this is Hudson Yards today. Uh, you can see the train yards. And for, 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 for decades, those were active piers that eventually uh, were no longer used. And so the rail yards uh, gradually expanded. And if you think about it, this has to be a pretty unvaluable piece of land for the MTA and the city to think it was more valuable to store trains there than to build. Not 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, but 60, 70 years. Um, what the hope is it will be in five years, maybe? <clears throat> so the first question is really sort of, again, why there? So obviously, you have the land available. But what is it about that land that would make it seem it would be appropriate for that level of density, that intensity of use? Um, well, one of the things is you're very close to Penn Station, but you're also, because of the 7 train extension, very close to Grand Central. So as a sort of node of the city, or as a, as a place where clustering can occur, you're actually able to get people that live and work in more places within a 45 minute to one hour radius of Hudson Yards than anywhere else, even including the area around Grand Central. And if you have friends who live in, in New Jersey or places like that, you know it's incredibly hard for them to get to the east side. But now, because of the 7 train, because of the L train, because of the, of the cluster of trains at 34th Street, it is very easy for people to get to the west side. The second thing is, again, thanks to the success of the High Line, but also just the, the, the general transformation of neighborhoods all around that area, Hell's Kitchen, Chelsea, and so on, this became a very unique place to have a node emerge because unlike a lot of other neighborhoods in the city, think about how different Midtown is, which is just adjacent to this, just east. Hell's Kitchen, Chelsea. You have art, you have media, you have finance. There's very few places in a city as large as ours or others where within such close proximity you can have such a diversity of different uses. And I don't mean uses here in terms of whether it's office or residential, but the kinds of people that, that, that work and visit and go to the Chelsea Arts District are completely different than the people that go to Herald Square. And yet they could both be in such close proximity to where Hudson Yards will go is a pretty amazing thing if you think about it. Um, so here's the plan, the master plan as it emerged, emerges today. The construction mostly so far is focused east of 11th Avenue. Eventually when that's finished, the area west of 11th Avenue um, is going to occur. You can also see the High Line curling through here. At this point is that little spur that goes over to where the post office is. Uh, and then it comes around and then loops and eventually comes down a grade because it originally connected to the, to the rail yard there. Interesting side note about the High Line. Everybody knows that the World Trade Center site was the other end of it, right? Okay. Mm. So a big part um, of what the, the project set up to do was to integrate the High Line um, into, into the buildings. So if you guys go over there, you'll actually see that the, the buildings don't step back from the High Line, they actually step over it. So there's parts where the High Line goes through the middle of the buildings, much like it does in the warehouses further to the south. There's also an entire shift in massing in one of the tallest buildings, literally cracking it open to create a kind of visual connection uh, between the inside of the building and the outside. It allows people inside the building to see down the High Line, and also for people on the High Line to actually see into the building. The idea that this is a very transparent window was very important uh, to the conception of the mask of the, of, of the project. Given that the High Line bounds one side of it, but given that the fact that Hudson Boulevard basically comes over here and then has to make a, a hard sort of turn to the right to go west towards the river, you also begin to understand why it was that something like the vessel became so significant. Because you needed a certain kind of urbanistic gesture or sort of moment that would literally reorient a system of travel on the High Line, a system of travel from the boulevard, and then take all of those forces and turn them 90 degrees. If you think about great cities around the world, there are not many successful urban interventions, urban spaces, that take hard, hard rights or hard lines. They Axes tend to go and then they tend to stop and they tend to end. This idea of continuity uh, or intersection is is something that that's, happens, but you really have to figure out a way to sort of encourage it to happen. I'll leave it to all of you as to whether the vessel is a work of genius to do that or not. 
But the fact that something at that intersection had to happen um, is, if you think about it, a, a, a very important aspect of how you negotiate these sort of two intersecting urban spaces. I have two quick questions about the vessel. Yeah. A, is there an admission? And B, how does it operate with the ADA uh, compliance? Both of those are incredible questions, and I wish I knew the answers. Okay. Um, yes, I guess. I, both do you both. lean towards there being admission, or do you think it's free? Just your gut feeling? I don't know. Um, suffice to say that if there is a price of admission, I'm sure I'll have to pay it as well. Um, uh, this is a view of the of the tower, um, and you can see the high line kind of disappearing below it. So this idea that you can actually create and extend that sort of space of the high line, because what everybody loves about the high line that you used to lose when it got to the rail yards is that sense of enclosure. It's also this idea of thinking about it as a sort of multi-level city. So the bottom level, of course, is the rail yard. And one of the amazing things about this is that during the entire time it was under construction, no function of rail yard could be compromised and no train could be delayed by even 30 seconds due to Hudson Yards. The trains get delayed all the time, but not, not, <laughs> not due to Hudson Yards. Um, and so what, what begins to happen is that you actually are seeing this sort of mega project that's actually functioning in a way like a bridge because there's no terra firma between the two buildings for, for any part of that to come down. So there's more steel being used in these towers than there are in the entire World Trade Center complex. Um, are these the ones connected to the shed? Uh, they're across from the shed. The shed's sort of coming over to it. Yeah, great. So the, the shed right. is this, is this right green there. guy, and then the two blue guys and the orange guy in the middle oh. are the... So the coach? Yep, the coach. Yeah. exactly. This is awesome. You guys are actually really like. <laughs> no, I, I love it. It's like it's like it, what what um one of the most satisfying I think transformations to see in, in education since at least I've been teaching is ten years ago nobody sort of really cared to know what was going on inside the buildings that were that were being done. People could rattle off who the designers were, but not like why the buildings were built or who lived there or who they were for or anything. Mm -hmm. So to see that people actually care about all the aspects of these buildings is, is actually really delightful. Um, <clears throat> so a close-up of, of, of how that, how that um, could happen. Um, the, the shed, obviously, is a very important part of that, so awesome question. Um, and the sort of flanking relationship of this notion of creating, again, multiple levels of, of activity. Because the, the, if you think about the, the issue that you have with so many contemporary projects. Their vast scale means that there's always a very small percentage of them that are publicly accessible and you know it. And there's something that is incredibly unforgiving, a little bit dinky, about a 50-story building where like you have like, like one little story at the bottom that's like for, for, for public space. Um, this notion of, of the sort of of how, of how buildings begin to manipulate space, I think was important to understand that it went even into the massing. So obviously the most salient point about the buildings is the fact that they lean in these two different directions. And one of the questions we get asked a lot is why. So one of, one of the, I think the best diagrams to explain this is the series of, of images that go sort of around the building. And of course you have the classic problem of twinning, right? When you have two buildings, as you move around them, there's gonna be points where one or the other disappears. And even for a lot as you go around, when they're, they're pretty big, they're gonna be sort of like one building for, you know, let's say, 180 of the 360 degrees of the circle. By creating this, this lean, first of all, the independence of the two buildings as being separate and unique is maintained for almost every vantage point. And you sort of get the classic sort of gateway east-west view, but you get as much visual tension and dynamism no matter where you are in the city looking at them. Because the irony, of course, is that as they're cited right now, if it was only about the gateway effect, then the only view that would be worth having is the one from New Jersey, which is an important one. But this idea that a composition of two buildings can create and manipulate visual space as much as it can create urban space, I think is something that's very important. Um, How tall are they? Uh, the, the tallest one will be uh, 1,300 uh, feet, basically. How many stories? Counting stories is a very, is a very yeah, dicey, yeah, no, dicey, dicey operation, yeah. But there are like, I mean, the, the photo with the Empire State was... Yeah, they're they're up there. They're not taller than Empire State, but they're up there. Okay. Yeah. But they're up there. They're up there. 
Um, and then it gets into, I mean, they're not taller than the Empire State with the spire, but then yeah. they have a higher occupiable floor. The, the, okay. the observation deck will be higher than the one that So they will change the, the, the skyline. Sky yeah. Okay. Um, one of the other things that we set out uh, to do was to make sure, and it, and it is something that when you see the buildings from far away, of course, they tend to flatten into the pure profile of what they are. But I think that, that one of the things, and this is that sort of sweet spot to occupy is architects that do urbanism and the other way around, is this idea that texture is important even in buildings where, let's say, the most common material is glass. So I think one of the, the sort of disasters of long contemporary architecture is the Crystal City, the city of nothing but sort of flat, reflective glass buildings. And it's unfortunate is that from a great distance, of course, you may lose some of the intricacy and detail that are actually happening. But I think when you go to the site and actually see these buildings, the way that light plays on them and the way that they seem to move and um, shift before your eyes as you walk around them, I think is a really important aspect of this. And so there's very few surfaces in the building that are actually truly flat. There's a lot of depth overlap um, and manipulation of, of texture. Um, around, uh, in the past few years, we've been moving into, into sort of, I think, um, rethinking some of what we know of, of cities as they are today. So one of the ones, uh, recent projects that we've done that's been a lot of fun um, is working uh, with uh, several organizations um, on the future of the driverless car and how that might impact cities. So uh, this was a collaboration between us, IBM, your neighbors up the street, uh, Arab, MIT, um, and a group called Data and Society, which uh, are a very interesting group of people. I should, I, I should perhaps, they need a more interesting name. Um, <clears throat> so what, one of the things that, that has always struck us is we all are very unified in our understanding of what the street is today. So there's sidewalks for people, and the middle um, is for cars. So that's our conception of, this, of, of, this, of the street. But actually, for most of history, this was it. It was a shared experience that you know there was people that were trying to get somewhere. There was people that were trying to sell stuff. Life and interactivity happened in the street. And it was obviously slow, but it was very lively, and it was very effective, and it made for community. And what really killed that was when things that could kill you started to take over most of the street. So what's amazing about that is the experience of actually being next to cars moving fast. It's something that's so unpleasant that when the pedestrianization of a lot of the city squares was first proposed, people were convinced it would fail. Because who would want to sit you know, near cars, near traffic? Of course, what people I don't, I don't think realize is number one, that there's a real desperate need for, for public space in a city as dense as ours. But number two, that the, there's a relationship between the obstacles you put in the street and the movement of traffic around it. So the reason that there weren't horses running people over all the time is because the people were there, not the other way around. So similarly, as more and more of the sidewalks and streets get reappropriated by people, it becomes more and more pleasant um, to be there. So if you can imagine the, the, a, a future with largely autonomous vehicles gives us one of the best opportunities to actually rethink the street. Um, as, as we've started to, to develop and research it, we really think that there's sort of two models for how you can begin to think about the future um, of the driver's car. One uh, is a company that is not really popular right now, but is the Uber model. Um, the other is the Ford model. So in the Ford model, everybody who has a car today still has a car, but it drives itself. So that's great if you're sitting in traffic because you're coming in from some far-flung suburb, you can be typing away in your laptop, taking phone calls or whatever. But if you think about it urbanistically, in terms of sustainability, ecology, resources, in terms of equity, socially, economically, and otherwise, it's actually potentially a very bad model. Because one of the biggest impediments to people moving out of the city now is the inconvenience of having to sit for four hours in traffic. If you take away that inconvenience in some senses by allowing everybody to sort of keep working while they're in their own metal pod, the implications for the city could actually be pretty bad. So the other model, of course, is shared ownership. That you have no reason to own a car anymore because the cars are always available when you need it. And if you think about it, economically, there's a lot of reasons why that makes sense. I mean, cars, I think the average car sits unused 97% of the time, right? Because you sitting there overnight, sitting during the day. Even if you commute with it, you drive it to work or you drive it to drop off your kids at school, and then you're, you're, you're out of it again. So, the, the Economist ran um, a, 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 a simulation where they, they concluded 
you'd only need 20% of the cars that are on the road today to provide the same level of called automotive service that we all need if everybody just used a hail service. And you see this showing up in really remarkable ways. So for example, last year was the first time ever that LA, or two years ago now, that LA showed a decline in car ownership. And it's, it's attributed almost entirely to, to this. There's more and more people that just don't need it because you can get it whenever you, you want it. So the question is, urbanistically, how can we encourage that version of ownership rather than the version that's all private? And I will tell you for myself now, just being strictly for myself, that right now actually cities are more likely to penalize ride-sharing companies than they are to encourage them, which is really ironic, right, for the whole congestion pricing thing that happened the other day. If you drive into the city in your own car by yourself, you don't pay a dime. But if the three of us decide to share a car together in from Williamsburg, we will pay a $2.50 per person fee. So it's, and, and obviously the, the uh, car sharing is a source of much, much congestion, but in a lot of ways it's also, I would argue, the solution to congestion. So the question becomes, if you could um, even begin to reduce car ownership only slightly. So that's, I think, the other thing that's really important to remember is that there was a time when not everybody had smartphones, right? You didn't need everybody to have smartphones for changes to happen. Uber, Lyft, Seamless, you know, Instagram were all created even when only 20% of people had smartphones. You needed enough that an ecosystem was created and the transformations that we see in American society that start from this notion of like everything being accessible with your thumb happen way in advance. In fact, when those transformations happen, when Instagram happens, when Uber happens, is when the other 80% of people are like, you know what, I should get a, get a smartphone. So the same question begins to happen is, if only a few percent of, of people are encouraged to start using autonomous forms of transportation, and you start to free, free up roads, if 10% of parking goes away, 10% of street lanes are no longer needed because you just don't have as much traffic, um, and 10% of all these cars that are parked on either side didn't have to be there, how much land could you get back? Could you turn parking lots into housing? Could you create light industrial space and maker spaces around the city? Could you create real pocket parks? Because you, all of a sudden you have this open space you just didn't have before, street plazas. And also, could you address one of the fundamental transportation inequities, which is that most people who need public transport most live farthest from it. And so, the idea um, that the team has been developing um, is a notion of using autonomous vehicles as a way of extending existing transportation networks. So um, if currently 29% of New York City households are without access to transit at all, which is a pretty big number if you think about for a city that prides itself on, on mass transit, um, the first idea is that you begin to create what's called sort of granular networks for autonomous vehicles. So a car might be autonomous, but it picks you up and it drives around like everybody else. But what if there were ways that you could um, divert a lot of autonomous vehicles and moments where they're operating, let's say, most autonomously to streets, whether it's Queens Boulevard or a certain lane on the LIE or other, other spaces like this, where they begin to take advantage of, of the, the, the benefits of being autonomous. They can move faster and, and so on you begin to encourage, number one, more autonomous vehicles. <clears throat> number two, you concentrate them in places that might be safer because they're not just sort of driving around regular city streets, but they're beginning to sort of start there moving slowly, but then go places where they can go that are not gonna impact um, city streets. As those networks extend, you can begin to pull more and more areas of the city that right now are beyond transit into ready access to transit networks. So, you know, some, what might happen is not that people will stop using the subway, but somebody that's in really outer Kew Gardens, Queens, or on the very border of Long Island, or in the very upper part of the Bronx, might be able to, to hop in with a couple of people to a relatively affordable car option, um, get to mass transit, and then keep going. So as this grows over time, um, you create a situation where vast areas of the city are now accessible to a form of transit, which is really these sort of shared rides and shared, shared vehicles. <coughs> it's also a way of beginning to distribute 
pressures of affordable housing, of office space, because now there's not necessarily the pure benefit of absolute centrality. You can, ha you can have people that choose to live and work in, in outlying areas in ways that they, they can't now. Um, so a lot of what we've been doing is looking at the width of streets and what happens if you begin to recapture some of that area back from, from car lanes. Um, and of course, being architects, having fun with imagining um, what the sort of shared streets of the, of the future could be when you no longer have to have the complete sort of great protection that happens from having two little narrow sidewalks um, and one street in the middle. So this is a rendering of the Lydia. Yeah, completely. With the grass and um, at the same time, um, we've also been working on a master plan for a new subway line in Queens. Mm -hmm. So um, this would be, how many people here live or are from Queens? Anybody? See, it's an under, underrepresented borough. Mm -hmm. um, so it would start in Long Island City. Um, if you guys have ever been in Long Island City, you guys know there's a series of rail yards right at the south where the most recent couple of buildings are. This is actually entirely existing rail right away. So you wouldn't have to dig anything. This yeah. entire thing. And the MTA owns it right now. They own it. There would be no eminent domain. There'd be no condemnation. There'd be no digging. Um, so this is an image of what one end of the line might look like uh, near, near Jamaica Center. But again, always this notion of we're talking about a piece of infrastructure, but it has the potential to catalyze infill and growth even within areas of the city that a lot of people in Manhattan tend to forget. So you can think of a place like Queens or Brooklyn as really a collection of, of smaller little villages or neighborhoods. And what are the potentials of transformation that occur in places like that uh, when you have the investment in new infrastructure, new ways of working? So the way that the train line would, would work is it would run uh, basically through the hole in the donut, literally right pretty much through the area of Queens that has no transit service right now. Um, it offers an opportunity to really encourage a lot of economic development without any rezonings. Because even though you could build there right now, nobody is, and I doubt very few of you have even been to some of these areas, unless you've been to warehouse parties in MassPath, um, because there's no transit. So this idea also that you can encourage growth without displacing people is a really powerful idea, and there's very few places left in the city that you can, that you can do that. Um, also, there's this issue of housing. So there's all this room to build new housing, and you could build it affordably, even without subsidy, because the average rent for housing in that, in that area is two-thirds of the city average. So this idea that investment in infrastructure can also, at the same time, create opportunities for economic development and affordable housing solve other issues within the city, I think is really important. There's also the issue of resiliency. I think a lot of people living in Brooklyn would be a lot better off right now if this line was operational, at the precise moment they're about to take the L train um, offline. Yeah, in 2019. Yeah, that's what they're saying now. Okay. Um, and then of course the most amazing thing is because this piece of infra infrastructure exists, is that you could do basically nine miles of subway, 10 new stations, and you would do it for um, basically for half the price of the Second Avenue subway extension. Mm -hmm. And you do it for one tenth the price per mile. So this is a sort of um, a, visioning, a visioning that we're doing. Um, last. Have you proposed this? Or? Yeah, it's out. It's approved? Uh, the community boards, um, so we did the, what's, what I would call the visioning study. So uh, there was a, <clears throat> a very uh, forward-minded city councilwoman from one of the districts along here who sort of developed this line, the idea, as an alternative after the BQX came in, you know, the streetcar that's running they want to run in Brooklyn. The trackless train? Yeah, the one that's like, like going to go run up all along the waterfront. Exactly. So she thought it was a compliment. She couldn't get anybody interested. So we started to do some of the urban analysis, which is what I'm going to get into in a second, um, of why it might be a good idea. That allowed an engineering study to be done, which is how you might do the trains. But again, and this is, I think, a real, a real um, issue with so much urban planning today. There was a lengthy 500-page report that told you how much it was going to cost and how many people would use the train. And there wasn't a single mention anywhere in the report about how you might get affordable housing, about how you might improve any of the neighborhoods along the line, about any, like, if somebody comes up to you and says, buddy, I need $2.2 billion to do something, 
that's not usually the best way to, to, to gather you know, people to, to a cause and say that this is something worth doing. But if you can talk about the potential to revitalize neighborhoods, the potential to provide affordable housing, the potential to grow you know, new types of jobs, the potential to create new forms of public space, and do this all without displacing a lot of people, that's actually a, a pretty unique thing. So where we really came in was, and, and it's, it's really the sort of, it's the luxury and it's the, it's the beauty of the job we have as architects and as urban designers, is to think of, of the vision of what a place can be rather than, than just the sort of like fine engineering of, of, of what it takes. The engineering study was done by a, a firm named AECOM. They're a very large uh, firm that, that really knows how to do those things. I don't know the difference between one train set and another. Um, but what the urban potentials are is something that we all felt was, was very important. So uh, the city councilwoman, the Queen's Chamber of Commerce came to us to ask us to do this. Um, we did it. Um, it's been endorsed by the borough president and the city council members. And now begins the slow, torturous process of hopefully. What holding this about? Because this does seem like an incredible idea. I, I, was, <laughs> I, I wish I, I knew. I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, one is, where's the threshold in, in terms of this kind of share mobility, right? The, the Uber mm -hmm. model. Where is the threshold that you may start to think about public transportation? Uh, because why do you have to have privately owned uh, share vehicles rather than buses? And there, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to show you. Go forward, go forward. Uh, in fact, that was one of the models which I kind of skipped over. Um, was does it make sense, in fact, to do exactly what you're saying? I mean, I was, uh, there was an image in which there were like vehicles that were <coughs> clear if there were buses or cars. In one of your rendering, then maybe this one, right? Yeah. Um, okay. There, that one, and one out there. I didn't know. You know, you can think about why do you have cars and not public transportation, in fact, uh, or maybe a mixed system. I, I think that's actually that is a very um, excellent question, and it's one that that is um, I think lies at the crux of the curtain debate because what's amazing and and why we felt it was very important to do this study. Um, is that if there's one group or one organization that's really far behind on autonomous vehicles, it's actually governments. Private companies are, are investing in it. And the irony is, I think inadvertently, private governments, uh, gov uh, governments at all levels, are doing a lot to actually make it easier for it to, to sort of follow the current model of private ownership rather than shared ownership or even public ownership. And it, comes up in all sorts of like really strange ways, which is like one of the major objections, there's actually lawyers that are concerned that if you had a shared vehicle get in a car accident, is it the company, is it the manufacturer, is it the person in the vehicle? Mm -hmm. Whereas like there's a narrower sort of chain of command because if it's like your autonomous vehicle, even if, if something happens to it, at least somehow, maybe somebody could say you're partially to blame. Maybe you didn't take care of the vehicle. Maybe you didn't calibrate something. Who knows? So there's these very, really, really sort of strange questions of policy that, if anything, rather than thinking proactively about it, the other thing, of course, is if streets remain designed as they are today, then the, the best kind of car usage to go down them will be the cars as they are today, right? If you don't, if you don't take a sort of hand in transforming the way that cars are done. So for example, I mean, and cities did this before. They built highways, which encouraged private car ownership to move people out of, the, out, out of the city. So what you do with infrastructure and how you think about public space and the relationship to that kind of shared infrastructure is 100% going to impact the kind of resulting model, I think. The second question is for about the, this new train line, the new yeah. subway line. Is there anything happening at Alta Point? Because that is an incredible a potential uh, hub in, in Long Island City. Yeah. Because you have the tunnel that arrived there, you have the Long Island Railroad, you will have two subway. You have an exchange between this new line and the other one across. You have the ferries. And nothing is happening. I mean, the train station there is the most depressing, non existing thing that you can think about. It's a platform without even a ticket booth it's a, and, and a roof, nothing, right? Right. And, and it is an amazing place in terms of 
uh, envisioning a transformation uh, of uh, even the traffic in Manhattan. I mean, to, to make that one a very important knot of exchange of, of different uh, uh, mode of transportation. And so there is no plan for that one. Um, I mean, there's, there's some plans to build more housing. Um, the city has a couple of parcels that they uh, released. But I, you're, you're understanding exactly what the thrust of this is. And this is only a few images, obviously, from like a much longer uh, presentation, which is it has the uh, opportunity to completely rethink what, what both ends, both uh, Jamaica and Hunts Point Lyon City can be. Um, it's also one of the easiest ways if you wanted a one-seat ride to the airport. Um, there's, there's actually an existing connection between this train line that tracks and Sunnyside Yards, which go to Penn Station. So if you react, it's called the Montauk Cutoff. And there's actually a, a currently a competing plan to turn that into a new High Line. I don't necessarily, normally I agree, but I'd love to see actually a way that train use could be, could be shared on this. Um, and I, I think this idea of a sort of multimodal center that happening in, in Hunts Point would, would also do a lot to help the other aspect of it, which has never succeeded as well as it could have, which is office. Long Island City has really become a kind of sure. like residential suburb to, to Manhattan. Um, and because the number one measure of its success is still its immediate proximity to Manhattan. Whereas something like this now makes you rethink that actually when there's 180,000 people that become more accessible to Long Island City, it suddenly says to yourself, okay, and all the people, of course, that are coming to Jamaica and everything else, now this becomes a place that's worth getting people to rather than people from. So, yeah. From an to two. Exactly, yeah. Um, so actually, I, rather than talk about one Vanderbilt, I am going to just talk about one more thing, because I know we're going to be tight on time. Um, so I think both of those tie into um, an interest of what we're doing right now. Is that your building? To the yeah, this is oh yeah. My God. So this is so this is also um, and maybe I, I, I can't come back to this, but it's a pretty unique moment in 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 history because I guess at one time we are doing uh, have the privilege of doing I should really say um, Hudson Yards, which is a, everything on the very west. We were also involved in the Midtown East rezoning, um, helping the, the city planning city council and then doing one Vanderbilt. So the sort of notion of being able to, to have it um, as designers to have a role in these transformations of these sort of both ends of Manhattan is a, is a pretty unique opportunity. Um, I guess the, 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 the point that we really wanted to make here was just this notion that a lot of this ideas of urbanism translate into the vertical or into the individual building as much as they do at the sort of scale, scale of the city. So the idea of, of, the, of the building as, as a sort of organ within a larger whole and the role that it has within strengthening not just an individual piece, but an entire district. And I guess if, there, if there's anything that we end up talking about a lot just amongst ourselves, and I think some of you even know that from having, having joined us before, it's this idea of the role that, that, a, that a piece of architecture, even an individual building, has in really kind of growing or transforming the neighborhood and the district around it. So in this particular case, the question is you have this opportunity to sort of build right next to Grand Central, I mean, arguably one of the greatest monuments, at least in American architecture, if not the world. Um, so one is this notion again, of a multi-layered city and the way that a tower can bring that interconnectivity vertically into the, into the z-axis. The second is what the appropriate relationship spatially is between a tower which you might call an object building, and Grand Central, which as much as it's a big block, is fundamentally a spatial building. And so one of the most conspicuous moves is this idea that so much of the volume of the building, and when you look at the, at the photograph of the Santa construction, you can actually understand how big the space is, is lifting the building up to open up and maximize views to Grand Central. Because if you guys think about most, again, most cities in the world, the train station or any building like that is given a, an honorific place. There's a giant public space in front of it. There's a sort of approach. And Grand Central, strangely enough, doesn't have that. It's completely blocked in on almost every side except for Park Avenue South. So the idea that by, by carving away the base of the building and then lifting it up, we can begin to kind of give Grand Central the sort of honorific presence that it, it merits and deserves is one aspect. 
But of course, that lift is also performative. As you guys know, there's Second Avenue, <coughs> sorry, Eastside Access, which is the new um, trains for Long Island Railroad coming into Grand Central. We're going to push so many people out of the station, they literally didn't know where they were going to put them all. So one of the major aspects is that the building itself at the bottom, that underneath that sloped um, cut, is actually called the Great Room, which corresponds to the space inside of Grand Central. So that what you get is really between the Biltmore Room, the Vanderbilt Hall, the Grand Central Terminal Hall, um, and the Great Room with an R project, you get a node, or a cluster of these large halls that are, are suitable for the arrival experience into a great transit node. That cut also then goes along with opening up more space to, to walk and including the pedestrianization of Vanderbilt Avenue. So that the building, and by the way, just to give you a sense, the FAR for this building is 30. So you guys all know what FAR is in terms of like multiples of, of floor height. That's how sort of in New York and a lot of the cities, sizes of buildings are calculated. Hong Kong, mo most of it, is an FAR of 10. So we're, the level of density we're talking about here is truly, truly unparalleled. But this notion that it's not just about occupying space, that that density can be sympathetic and in fact coexist with this notion of creating a public realm, I think is really, really important. Um, and, and part of what we actually did in terms of sculpting the form is actually simulations of traffic loads and people and sidewalks and how much more would be able to be occupied both within the building and then also in the streets around the building. So this idea that actually by building something and occupying space, you can actually create a better public realm was, I think, a really prime driver of, of the project. And that extended up into the architecture itself so that the idea that, that parts of the top of the building will be open to the public in whatever form that may take, whether it's um, events, exhibitions, so not just an observation deck, but that actually that there's a sort of again, a great room that occurs at the top of the building it was really important what, with uh, the design of the project. Um, and that's uh, a rendering of the building, which should be done in two years, three, three years, two years. It's moving up very fast. Yeah. So you can get, kind of get a sense of, of, um, how, of how great the, the, the public space is, because you see the bottom of the slope piece at, at the top over there. So I guess the last thing is um, just the use of some new techniques. So. At the beginning, you'll see when we were talking about Sando, we were sort of like hand mapping and laying out um, a lot of things individually. Thanks to parametric tools like Grasshopper, GIS, and others, we're now able to actually, I think, dig a lot deeper than we've ever been before and think about the urban experience in ways that go beyond figure ground, width of streets, amount of green space, and so on. So for example, um, can you use a density of 311 complaints as a proxy uh, for quality of life. Um, can you talk about desirability through how many photographs are posted to Instagram or Flickr data? Um, can you uh, begin to talk about um, space, not just at the ground level, but as a continuous percentage of how much of the sky you can see as you move up and down within, within buildings? Um, can you begin to measure pedestrian density? And if you do that, can you begin to make those determinants of urban form? So one of the things we're doing research on right now, and I really wish I could talk to you more about this project, but I can't, um, is on what we call performative zoning. So the idea that you don't actually prescribe the shape or form of a building, but the criteria of what a building should fulfill. So most zoning is about ensuring a certain amount of light reaches the street and a certain number of people are in the building. Could you, instead of saying that, just say, you have to create a building that gives us this much light and this kind of public space and this many people and leave the form completely out of it so that there could be really inventive ways of, of getting to those solutions. <clears throat> Some of the tools that we're using, obviously, are things that people already know, like views and daylight analysis. But we're also doing things like, for example, simulating how it is that people walk around and actually perceive retail. Um, we're able to use the opening hours of restaurants and people's cell phone data, like the number of times they post or do a Google search for something, to get approximations of the pedestrian density of various different streets in a place like uh, the financial district. This is my favorite one because this is East Village. So if you look at when people are in the financial district, it's like middle of the afternoon, and you look at like there's all these restaurants and bars that don't open 
and all the sidewalks don't get become busy until like 8, 9, 10 p.m. at night. Versus Midtown, which is completely alive during the weekend and completely dead during the weekends. Um, can we use Google Place data to begin to identify not just streets and corridors, but actually nodes, different ways that people experience cities? So restaurants, retail. And then the, the last thing is, um, can we think about cities in terms of urban experience? So for example, this is designing cities around thermal comfort. Um, so cold, hot, and can we use urban form to get more light into spaces that are cold, to block wind from places that are cold, encourage wind to places that are hot? Um, and then, can we begin to study what that means on actual sites? So this is a, um, a, a, a new extension uh, to a Canadian city. And we're studying block size, block rotation. We're able to evaluate that in terms of various different heights and densities as things get taller, less ground coverage, where things are located. different typologies. And then finally, optimizing. Is it more important to create a city that prioritizes thermal comfort or ease of mobility and access? Or ultimately, obviously, we're searching for something that's, that's easily in between. Thanks. This was incredible. Thank you so much. This was Thanks like for real patience stuff. and the great questions. So at KPF, do you guys have like your own team that does this data analysis? Um, so the data analysis, yes. We have a, a, a really incredible group of, of people. Um, they call, it's called KPF UI. Um, but what's really great is that they're not sort of like off sequestered in some like floor in some office building like 30 blocks away. They're just, they're, they're just people that are around KPF that have been, that sort of have come together to do this. And we involved in a lot of projects. So, for example, the, the silo simulation from one Vanderbilt. Um, when you saw the Queens line, there was all this data about how many street lots were available, what densities, how much population, and stuff like that. That was all coming through them, data load analysis, and so on. Elsewhere, I think one thing that to point out is that we don't have an urban design team. So, we as an office, so like somebody like myself, might be working on a master plan in Boston, and also doing a small school, uh, you know, like a school building for NYU, and a, a uh, like a facade piece for Michael Kors. So that's actually true. You know, um, doing the study, like we were working on the, the subway line in Queens at the same time as I was doing a residential project in, in Boston. And there's there are offices that focus on you know, there's urban planning experts and housing design experts or whatever. We think that sometimes the most innovative ideas come through people working on a variety of different things and cross-fertilizing their experiences from one project to another. Which sort of means we're kind of um, masters of none, but that's still, sometimes we ask the stupidest questions in the room. Sometimes those are the ones that get the best answers. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what, what, other, what other cities do you guys have left in your class? Mobile ones. So in fact, the study about the car. Pretty, pretty. The driverless car is very good. Thank you. I know you have questions. I'm going to start pointing to Dylan, and then you must have a question about the, <laughs> the mobility. I know this one is the one question I did have about the Queens Railroad is yeah. who funded the initial study? That's complicated. <laughs> um, the initial initial study we actually did pro bono. There was no funding for it. It's a catch twenty two. Uh, I, I don't normally believe in in. I mean, I believe in pro bono work, but I don't normally believe that architects should do lots of work for free because we provide a valuable service. But it's a catch-22 because you can't convince people to spend money on a study until you've proven that there's something to study. So the original visioning, the very rough draft of what you see now, 
Um, we did over a matter of like three or four days just to say that it was a possibility. Um, that led to a city council grant to do the study, which in, in typical New York City fashion went through the Department of Transportation and was considered an engineering study. So no architects ourselves or anybody else were invited to even participate. Just went to ra railroad engineers basically. Um, so then after that happened, you know, you had this 500 page study after six months. Um, and so then the Queen's Chamber and, and the uh, City Councilwoman and a couple of other uh, concerned parties from Queens um, came to us and asked us to then sort of flesh that out into, into something more. Um, and so they, they raised money for that independently and then, and then uh, you know, paid us. It's a very interesting thing that, that you know, maybe a sad critique that in this day and age sometimes it's easier to get funding for engineering studies than for designs of public space, but sometimes it's true. Useful one, <laughs> no, no, I mean, which is very, very important. I mean, one of, we're we're also working on a reimagining of the of the Port Authority bus terminal. Um, and obviously, I mean, on the one hand, nothing will transform that area of Manhattan more than reimagining what it is. On the other hand, you can't do that at all without understanding how buses move. And again, chalk that up with another thing like train sets. That I have no idea how that happens. Uh, nor does a lot of people on our team that are working on it. Uh, I'm, I'm not, but we're working with really amazing engineers because obviously, if you could find a more efficient way to pack the buses, maybe you might carve out some more opportunity for meaningful public space. Because it's it's actually really sad if you look at that building, the percentage of space for people versus mm -hmm. the actual buses. By reimagining, in this case, you mean possibly doing serious, serious construction or demolishing it altogether, but a new one? Can't say. <laughs> <laughs> it's all under. <laughs> okay. Um, and what is, the, what is the main motivation behind the Queen's pro bono study? Like, what would KPF as a, an organization? We, we, I mean, what we're, we're, we're very invested in New York. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was also, we knew we could, could come up with something very compelling in a very quick amount of time. Um, and we thought we, we we really genuinely believed in what in what um, uh, this this councilwoman was was proposing, and we knew that there wasn't gonna, like she wouldn't get the evidence without the help of of KBFUI. And, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I think a lot a lot of the work. Um, it's very funny. I think I think as a firm that people know a lot about, people know very little about us. Like they, they a lot of people know us, but not about us. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think a lot of the work that we do goes sort of below the radar. Um, so a lot of people don't know that we were involved in the Chinese rezoning. We didn't write it, we didn't come up with it, but actually the, the city council's ability or the city planning's ability to, to execute it depended on a lot of the research work um, and simulation work that we did. Um, so, you know, things like that. So you work very closely with the city planning yeah. agencies. Yeah, and, and we, I mean, I think we don't, we're always trying to situate ourselves in that sort of in between. So for example, obviously we're, we're not from Shenzhen, China, mm -hmm. but we found that over the past couple of years, I think we may have at the same time in that city 25 projects and of a certain size also, I mean, it's not small. So we've started working very closely with city planning there to try to think about like, are there you know, better ways to, to think about the planning of a, of a linear city like that one? Um, you know, same, I mean, you, you can't imagine how one might uh, begin to bring in a habit to Covent Garden without also sort of thinking of a larger uh, picture. So I think it's that, that that the act of architecture doesn't stop at the confines of the box or blob or whatever. And that's also done, I mean, and KPF is a global company, so you have offices and it's around in London and I assume in China as well. Right? So. What is the, how does, I guess, how does New York office interact with those and what is the kind of dynamic there? We're, we're, we should ask more go. <laughs> we're, we're, um, uh, we're, we're, we're different from a lot of other offices in the sense that we have offices other places, but we're really one office. Meaning, um, you guys have already, I assume, like, intern in a bunch of places and whatever. So a lot of larger offices are set up in a couple of ways, right? So. One way is that they're set up as a sort of like network or a franchise. So there's like, you know, there's a, an office in San Francisco, San Jose, Santa Clara, Portland, Chicago, New Delhi, China, whatever. 
and I mean, of course they have a common website and they share information and whatever. Mm -hmm. But the reality is you're getting each individual group kind of, like if you get the New Delhi, if you see some building that you love that they did in New York and you call up and say, hey, I'd like to do a building in New Delhi, mm -hmm. you're getting the New Delhi team. They, they, they may have never been involved with the right thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe they'll get like the drawings and a phone call from the guys in New York who did that one building, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the major benefit of that system is you're also getting local knowledge, because obviously the people in New Delhi know New Delhi way better than, than, than I do, for example, or Mumbai, India, where I've done a bunch of work. On the other hand, they sort of only know that, and they're not necessarily able again, to kind of cross-fertilize the best ideas of what might be happening in other places, because they haven't been involved. Um, some firms try to get around that by creating sec sector, like sector expertise. So they'll have like, oh, off of, like for tall buildings that New York team's involved no matter where it is, but they're sort of like tall building experts. Um, or, you know, if it's hospitality, it's like the LA teams, like, or, you know, if it's airports, it's whatever team. So you'll get New Delhi plus, like, a guy from, you know, or, or a woman from the Chicago office because she knows something about airports. But um, the other obvious model is called the mothership model. So, like, there's a really high-end architecture office in London. You call them up, you'd say, I want one of those. And they're going to make you exactly the same one that they made in Cincinnati, that they're going to do in London, that they're going to do in... In Beijing, and, and you know, there might be obviously differences, but you're kind of like you're calling up to get a thing, like, mm -hmm. like I want, I want that thing. They make, make me that thing, and, and get, just figure out how to get that thing here. Um, so, and again, there, there is also, I mean, that I'm kind of sort of belittling a little bit, but obviously there's there's benefits to that too in terms of certain approaches mm -hmm. to design innovation and so on that are that are good in that kind of situation. The way that we're set up is that um, virtually all the design happens in New York. Um, but when I say that, it's really not true because the teams are made up of people that might be in different places. So if we're working on a project, for example, in Shenzhen, there might be three people in our London office, three people in our New York office, and two people in, in, in the Shenzhen office. But they're all working on the project at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's not like only, the Shen, only people in Hong Kong are working on it. It's not like people here are working on it who have no idea what's going on over there. Mm -hmm. And it's not like also this idea of a handoff that like somebody in New York makes a beautiful sketch and then emails it to China and hopes the people in China know what to do with it. <laughs> it happens more than you know. Yeah. Um, it's this idea that like the, the project is always being developed between the people on the ground and mm -hmm. the place where it where it is or familiarity with it because one of the benefits is I think we have 43 nationalities in our office right now, so you can usually find somebody who's from that place or mm -hmm. has a brother. Um, and and this idea that, that you then so you're, you're constantly and that's also why we don't have studios because I mean as an example if like like the example I always like to give um, a few years, years ago it used to be that you know everybody said residential and hotels are completely different the the woman who does hotels the woman who does residential c could never do the other because they're so unique except now everybody wants to stay in Airbnbs and, and, and places that are more like apartments. And everybody wants their residences to have all the amenities and things like that. Like so tell, so tell me who's your best. <laughs> or like if you have a project like um, Pacific Park in Brooklyn. So it's a Brooklyn developer, except it's not. It's actually a developer owned by a bunch of people in Cleveland. All the money is coming from China, and right, and and they've never done a project this big. So the actual development expertise to do a project that big is coming from China. They're building over train tracks, and the engineers who really know how to do this might be based in New York, but their best engineers are in Boston and also connected to another firm in Germany. Right? The, most of the people that are, are moving to Brooklyn right now are not necessarily from Brooklyn, they're from you know, South Carolina, Brazil, France, you know, Boston, Canada. So on the one hand, like Brooklyn is like and, and, and of course this idea of Brooklyn is like the ultimate of local. Mm -hmm. Except you go everywhere and they like they have the menus like they have in Brooklyn and they, they, like there's a, a Brooklyn restaurant. I mean, I have a friend who goes around and just posts on Instagram all the places you see in Brooklyn style restaurants and bars. So, in a sense, like there's no there's no such thing as like as local anymore. I mean, it is local. Obviously, you have to know Brooklyn and you have to know all about the different neighborhoods and the intricacies and the history of brick architecture and cast iron architecture and all the rest of it. On the other hand, the person who last week may have been in China dealing with that developer, or that, right, probably understands how to deal with them better. And the person who, you know, a month ago was doing a 20-story residential building, which is very different than doing a 50-story residential building in Manhattan, might, so what you need at the end, there's no person that's gonna have all the pieces that's necessary to do a project like that. What you want is a team 
where one guy is saying, oh, I did our last three buildings in Brooklyn. Why is she on it? And she goes, because I've done the last six residential buildings in China, so I understand what the developer's actually talking about. And then I'm like, like, why he's on it? And he's like, well, our last three buildings that are only 20 stories tall that are residential and very efficient, you know, I did it. So everybody's bringing something to the table that you can't necessarily ascribe to like one studio or one set of expertise. So I think that's the long-winded way of kind of not answering the question. Sounds like a great place to work, <laughs> that's for sure. It's What's the size of your New York office? Four, two, four hundred and four fifty. So it's it's large, um, but in but I think we're a lot smaller than a lot of the other offices of, of, of our size. I think we're about the same size globally as um, Herzog, Demeron, OMA offices like that. So it's this weird thing that because of the three letters, we're sort of held in that kind of like a corporate echelon of like mm -hmm. HOKs and Gensler's and SOMs, which are all like four or five times our size. Really? Yeah. yeah. 3,000 people. I don't, I don't know what SOM is, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not small, but it's plenty disorganized. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for a project as big as the Boston project, mm -hmm. do you look at um, kind of how like you organically grow the space? Um, so we just looked at a project in Copenhagen by Kobe Architects, mm -hmm. and they are working on a city extension or something like that. We're doing just parts at a time. Yep. Are you doing that with Boston at all, or are you going to build a lot of it at once? Uh, well, that that is actually how Boston was supposed to, supposed to evolve. So um, the the idea was that um, uh, it would evolve organically. I think one of the hardest questions to ask in any time you do kind of urban design, well, anytime you do urban planning, is how you separate architectural and public space design from the overall conception of the plan. Because it's very easy and very convenient to sort of draw blue strips and say light blue strip is phase one, you know, dark blue strip is phase two, and so on and so forth. But the problem is, is that is always how do you um, define a certain kind of aesthetic and spatial unity to the thing. And I don't mean uniformity, but like, but I mean not that necessarily uniformity is bad. Again, it's the examples of like Brooklyn or Paris Express. So I, th I think the the misfortune in some sense of the early phases of Boston is that the architecture as it was built did not live up to the aspirations of what the plan inspired to. The plan worked. I mean, you know, the park was built early, the district hall, the innovation spaces were built, the you know, little playgrounds, the pop-up cafes, and all of that happened. Um, it survived a major recession, which would have destroyed most master plans. In fact, now it's even being reimagined. There's like about 40% of it's left, and actually uh, Nader, who's here, is in fact re-planning re, re the, the plan of that area again. Um, in response to sort of like what's evolved over time. Um, and I think the, the challenge that I think, for example, having seen what, what he's, been, he's been doing there, is over time a greater and greater willingness by the developers and the city to allow there to be an aesthetic component, a formal component, that is more than just illustrative. And what I mean by that is that um, very often, particularly in the US, there's this idea that you make a plan you write it in very generic text, but in order to get a community to approve it or a government to approve it, you create these images, renderings, plans, whatever, that show what it's going to look like. But you have to, and there's a reason everybody loves the watercolor, is because it's, it's not so prescriptive that you're saying exactly what it's gonna look like, but kind of what it's gonna look like, because you kind of haven't actually written anything that says it will look like that. And so you boil down a master plan into a certain number of square feet certain number of people, a certain amount of green space, and you've done everything in your power to actually not prescribe that it has to look or feel a certain way. And I think the Boston Master Plan sort of tests the limits, or approved the limits of what that will achieve. So um, now what's really great is number one, by our getting back involved, and then also the remaining pieces sort of being slightly rewritten again by people like, like Nader, is that aesthetic dimension, that formal and spatial dimension, is being brought back in. That how much glass a neighborhood has, precisely how wide the sidewalks are, what materiality is used, how much planting, 
like where you have recesses or don't have recesses, where you have relief in a cornice line or whatever, actually matters. You know what I mean? So I guess going like I know, I know the Kobe plan. I've seen a lot of images of it. What I don't know for myself is to what degree those images are suggestive of a plausible or possible future that may or may not happen, or to what like there's enough authorship and um, integrity in the way that the plan will be executed that I'll actually live up to that. If that makes any sense. Um, and I think I mean like it, and I think it, it's very interesting actually to, to look at Houseman in Paris. Because everybody forgets, actually, that you know the way that Paris looks on those boulevards was actually part of his plan. He mandated where the piano mobile had to be, how much balconies there were, how much projection and recesses you had to have in the windows. So Paris is not an accident. And so people always talk about this idea of the organic. Paris is not organic. It was planned and designed to be that way. And in a lot of senses, the cities that we like and love, whether you know it's parts of Rome uh, or, you know, I mean, if you think about um, uh, you know, uh, Oaxaca in, in Mexico, I mean, which is a really amazing and beautiful city. I mean, these were not accidental. They were choreographed to, to, to come out that way. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you Thanks so for much. Having me.